On the Road with Auntie Dem, the special Psycho Dish Editions. And uh, we're back with the man himself who... Now, we were going to discuss, now that we're done with your family history, get a little bit into philosophy, politics, faith, all of that. And you had some stuff to say, starting with the fact that Black Lives Matter made you late for work the other day. So... You can find this on WTVR.com, the local Richmond TV station. Thirteen protesters stood across Interstate 95, just under the Chamberlain Avenue overpass, and stopped traffic for half an hour. Because I have all those years of uh, cab driving, I have a kind of uncanny instinct for traffic and for what's going on with the freeway. So my spidey sense told me that I needed to get off the freeway, and I did, and I missed it. I drove past it. But I did get to look on the local TV news at video of 13 Uyghurs. And I know that's an offensive term, but that's what they are. They are Uyghurs. And I'll go further. I'll finish it. If you don't know what a Uyghur is, here we go. Ready to bleep? Three, two, one. It's a white nigger. Yes, you can bleep that out. And if it didn't get bleeped out, you can be mad now. I don't think my audience is going to be too mad. Okay. These 13 stood across the freeway because, in their mind, damn it, if they stood across the freeway and stopped traffic, we would understand that Black Lives Matter, and damn it, in the capital of the South, in the heart of slavery, in the city that had Lumpkin's Jail, we would stop being assholes to blacks and the cops would care about black lives. And this 30 minutes blocking traffic would change our attitude towards blacks. And it would work. We would fix our shitty attitude towards blacks. So did it work? No. Now this seems to be something kind of common with the uh, social justice crowd. Yes. Which is... They would rather signal their virtue than do something actually constructive that would require effort that might help the problem a little. Right. So, the funny thing is, not far from this protest is Gilpin Village, which is a classic 60s liberal left-wing public housing project, which is a slavery plantation that traps blacks into permanent poverty so that the left can signal that they are doing something for the poor. If they really gave a shit about the poor, they would shut those projects down. If those 13 people standing across the freeway actually cared about black lives, if for them black lives matter, they would walk off that freeway, walk into Gilbin Court, and volunteer along with all of the churches and volunteer organizations that are currently working to close Gilpin Court and help those people become self-sufficient. But no, they stood across the freeway for 30 minutes and told us that black lives don't matter. Black lives don't matter to whom? And before you go and blow up the internet about how I'm a conservative Nazi son of a bitch asshole, remember, in the last hour, remember my history. Remember where I come from. I am every bit allowed to say what I'm saying. Well, that's my question, you know. 52% abortion rate of black pregnancies. The vast majority of black people murdered in this country are murdered by other black people. So my question is, yeah, to whom do black lives matter? Judging by those things, not to black people themselves, and if not to them, why to me? The worst of it is, if you go back to the WTVR st story, and you go look at the cell phone video of that 13 that stood across the freeway, there was only one curly-haired guy who was even nearly, maybe slightly black. The rest of them were solidly white, ruddy-faced, university-educated. And one of the things that blew me away is, where did their t-shirts come from? Where did their jeans come from? Because if you pay attention, they were jeans that you find at the thrift store? No. Nordstrom! They came from Nordstrom! All these people bought their clothes at your favorite fashion emporium, your favorite first world, white collar, upper middle class emporium. These are not poor people. 
Hi, I'm going to complain about the 1% on my $900 Apple iPhone. Yes, sir! And it's just all about the signaling. Absolutely. Which is totally different. You know, you can say what you want about Catherine and her activism. She went down to Mississippi. She lived there. She taught black people how to do something useful to make money. That's totally different from what we're seeing now. Completely different. And what really frustrates me about the left and the youngins in the left is that unlike, unlike my grandmother, who went down to Mississippi and started a small business with African Americans, these kids do things like punch cops in the face, shut down freeways, and it's all about the optics. Right now, I'd have to go look, but right now there are probably a dozen or more volunteer organizations involved in Gilpin Court trying to make a difference, trying to help people out. I am friends with a pastor who is currently working in the Richmond City Jails to help these guys come out of jail and get jobs. If you really give a crap about black lives, I've got a pastor's name for you, and he's got volunteer positions for you where you can make a difference today. Well, this goes back, I think, to the New Testament and to Jesus turning to the Pharisees and saying, okay, Here's the thing. Do you want to do good, or do you want to be seen doing good? Well, there's too many that want to be seen doing good. And this isn't just a Catholic thing, or a Methodist thing, or I happen to be Presbyterian, a Presbyterian thing. One of my lifelong frustrations with my fellow Presbyterians is missional tourism, is showing up in some third world country, and there's a dog and pony show while they build a church, or they dig a well, or blah, 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 and then they go home. What happens to that church or well the rest of the year? There's 52 weeks in the year. 50 weeks a year, and that church is dark. The village leaves it alone because it is the white people's church when they show up for missions. And the well, of course, something will break a month or two later. There's nobody there to fix it. There's no money for parts. Right. The nearest guy who knows how to fix the damn thing is 200 miles away. Yes. And so, so it does nothing. Yes. The women in the village who've been hauling water up the mountain for 100 years or more pick up their buckets and go back to what they've been doing for a century or more. So how big a threat really is signaling to getting anything useful done? Well, Christians have been outliers for a couple millennia. We were getting killed by the Romans when we started. We were house churches and an underground until Constantine, which is 400 years or so of a dissident movement within the Roman uh, Empire and the Jewish community. We know how to do this. We don't need the signalers. We don't need the government. We don't need anybody. We just need to reach back into our heritage and remember the things that we did when we started out. Now, I have compared signaling, in a sense, to carbon monoxide, which is the way that carbon monoxide kills you is it actually bonds with the cells in your bloodstream that are supposed to carry oxygen through to your body more easily than they bond with oxygen. So if you have a room with some oxygen and some carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide is going to end up bonding with those blood cells as it gets sucked into the lungs and going through your body, and you're going to asphyxiate in a room that actually does have plenty of oxygen in it. The thing is, if people bond with signaling, if that's their way of thinking that they're doing something good, then they're going to do that instead of doing something that's genuinely useful. The hard work of volunteering in Gilpin Court, or you don't have to come to Gilpin Court. You can do this in your own community. There are public housing projects. There are volunteer organizations engaged in serving public housing projects. Go find them. Go volunteer. The thing is, that doesn't have the emotional punch, the impact that standing across a freeway for 30 minutes have. And I think part of what I see is that people want that emotional gut punch. They want that adrenaline rush. It's not much different from the guy who's like, I'm an adrenaline junkie and I'm going to take my parachute and jump off this mountain so I can get that rush. It's a different rush. It comes from doing something that gets you on TV or gets you public notice. 
but it is still an empty adrenaline rush that goes away. It's hard finding a public housing project, finding an NGO or a volunteer organization that is actively working in that public housing project to make a difference is a bunch of legwork. You've got to engage that organization. You've got to qualify with them, prove that you are a worthy volunteer, that they do want you as a member. There's a lot of work involved, and it doesn't happen overnight. You can't just walk out onto a freeway and stop traffic. You actually have to do the social game. You have to apply to the organization. You have to do all this work ahead of actually arriving at the public housing project and getting something done. But that's how it happens. And having lived in homeless shelters and having lived in bad neighborhoods and having dealt with the real poor a lot in your day, I think you could say that one of the reasons that doing something real lacks that emotional punch is the real poor often are difficult, angering, frustrating, tough to deal with. Oh yeah. One of the famous things that happens all the time is some left-wing, bleeding heart, lovely, and that's not a gender term, and I'm not, not ta necessarily talking about a girl. Guys are the same way. We'll decide that the answer to the problem is a truck full of food. So they get up the truck full of food, they arrive in the poor neighborhood, and they drop the food, and we eat it, and it's good, we like it, thank you, bring us more. But we eat it, and then after the truck leaves, has the neighborhood changed? No. But if you would like to bring us more food, we'll happily eat it for you. So every so often, Oprah or somebody will give some big check to some homeless person to see what happens, and... Guess what? It's party like a rock star for a month, baby! This guy gets everything! And then, oh shit, the money runs out. And he's right back where he started. At the local rehab center. Now, what a lot of people don't understand about the ghetto is it is on paper extremely poor, but part of that is that there's a lot of the economy there that's off books. Oh yeah, and we like it that way. There's a phenomenal and lovely black market, including off-book community volunteerism and service. There are cups of sugar traveling between houses that never get recorded. And it should be said, not all of this black market is drugs. Not all of it's even illegal. No, sometimes it's, hey, are you hungry? Yeah, I'm cooking chicken. You want to eat? Yeah. So... My barbecue goes to the neighbor's house because I've got a little bit more and they've got a little bit less. And it isn't just giving stuff away, though. There's, I mean, there's real commerce. No, there's real commerce. There's a kid who wanted to cut my lawn and ruined his mower on my tall grass. Sorry, kid. Oops. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff that gets transacted in cash. And, you know, we yes. say it's, it's not illegal. I mean, other than avoiding whatever tax laws might be on the books if and whatever licensing requirements might be on the books if uh, one was going to keep completely on the up and up. Right. Some of you that follow my blog will know the story of Darlene who caught me at a moment when I was at an end of everything. End of gas, end of cash, end of phone minutes, end of rent, end of everything. Darlene calls me and says, what you doing? And I cried and said, I ain't doing nothing and I'm broke. And she said, well, I need a ride to the store. And I said, well, how in the hell is a ride to the store going to help me? And she's like, are you going to take me to the store or not? Okay, I'll take you to the store. So I took her to the store. And she gives me $3. Now, how is $3 going to fix my life? It's not. $3 is crap. $3 is a coffee in, in my first world. But she called me tomorrow and gave me 4 And the day after, it was 2 And funny thing is, over six months... Her two, three, four, five dollars ended up paying for my gas and keeping me on the road and helping me get to this house. Now that sounds a lot like basically just a gypsy cab service, which are all over economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Yes, but there's all of this kind of tit for tat, hand to hand cash. Your, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine that operates in the ghetto, that keeps the ghetto running and keeps people taken care of. 
So in a lot of ways, when we say, oh, the poor people down there, they only make X number of dollars a year. We got to run down there with EBT cards and with Section 8 and all that is kind of missing the point. Because we'll eat all that and ask you for more and go back to what we were doing anyway. By the way, there are some people who would say that Uber is basically just an app for hailing gypsy cabs. It is, but it's been discovered by the ghetto here in Richmond, and Uber is making a buttload off of people in communities where the cab companies won't go, but Uber will go there. Kind of reminds me of Taxi Unlimited, which would go anywhere. If you talk to a Taxi Unlimited driver between 1980 and 1985 and said, I don't have cash, but I have a pound of weed, that would work. So you started out from a long line of people who were on the left politically, maybe sort of with your dad drifting a little bit towards moderate, but your experiences have ended up with you in a way still identifying with the left and identifying with what they're trying to do, but on the right anyhow, because that shit just don't work. It doesn't work. The thing that the left fails to understand is that grassroots, community, person-to-person, neighbor-to-neighbor, good old Christianity, love your neighbors, love your enemies alike, do for each other, that kind of small-town tradition that exists in America works, and we don't need the government. The left keeps telling us that we need Pimp Daddy Uncle Sam to open his wallet and throw us a little money, and that's how we're going to fix the country. We don't need him. We do not need that pimp daddy. The traditions that we have in this country that don't involve the government, that are familiar, that are things your mama taught you, are the things that will get us out of this mess. Well, Moldbug talked a lot in, you know, sort of very elevated language about the difference between empathic charity and non-empathic charity, where more or less, if you boil it down, empathic charity is focused on the subject. It's focused on... I see you need something, I am going to help you. Where non-empathic charity is focused on, I want to feel like a good person. I want to feel like part of the solution instead of the problem, and therefore I'm going to help you. Well, the first always does good, and the second always does evil. Right. Every Sunday afternoon, bless her heart, and I mean that in every southern way to interpret that, a woman named... Mo Carnage, M-O-K-A-R-N-A-G-E, more Carnage, is out there with her beat-up old pickup truck feeding the homeless. She calls it Food Not Bombs, and she's been doing this for a decade. And for a decade, she has a faithful audience that shows up and gives her lots of warm fuzzies and loves on her and says, thank you, Mo, for feeding us. But If she stopped, they would go away, and they would find other ways to get that meal. But Mo, because she's interested in signaling, in showing that she's making a difference, will continue, and I don't know if I want Mo to go away, but it's a dependency on Mo. If if Mo wasn't there, these people would not get off their ass and do something for themselves. And that's my objection to it. I love Mo. I love the fact that she puts in probably 20, 40, 20, 30 hours a week dumpster diving and getting this meal together for Sunday afternoon. And I encourage you, if you're in Richmond, Virginia, go find her and give her a hug because, bless her heart, she's trying. And I appreciate the effort. I think it's wrongheaded and ineffective, but I do understand that she's putting in the work and, and, and the work Rather than standing on a frickin' freeway and blocking traffic, at least Mo is in Monroe Park with her food, feeding people. And the problem also is, if your concern is with signaling, you don't know and you don't care and you're never going to find out what actually does help. No. Um, Those 13 from a week, a week and a half ago, went to jail. Gilman Court, still the same. And in fact, if anything, they've just gotten eight cops shot over the last couple of weeks. Which, how the hell does that help? Yeah, it's like, let's take race relations, which are already shitty and basically always have been, 
and let's whip people up into as big an angry frenzy as we possibly can and see how that helps things. So let's take things to an extreme. There's a lot of fiction that does this. In fact, lately it's Seven Eves that starts the novel off with the moon blew up. Let's take that to an extreme. Those 13 people are signaling the end of something that in a decade or so results in Washington burning. And the anarchists cheer because finally Washington burning and it'll be better. You've destroyed an existing system which, though it's dysfunctional, it is at least functional to some degree. And we can rely on it to have the first world life that we have. And you've now taken that away with nothing to replace it. But that's how the left operates. It's always, well, to have utopia, we've got to tear down the current system. Well, what happens if they tear down the current system and it turns out that the perfect really was the enemy of the good, that utopia never comes and, uh uh-oh, you just tore down a system that, while not perfect, worked pretty okay for most people and you've got absolutely nothing to replace it with. So go to United Way and volunteer. Build your victory garden in your backyard. So when the zombie apocalypse happens, you do have a vegetable garden. And though Kroger is closed, you've got tomato plants. So no, you don't have everything you could have gotten at Kroger, but you do have tomato plants. So at least tonight, there'll be a tomato salad. I don't know about tomorrow night. So what would more or less be your plan? I mean, you can't just tear down the current system and replace it with utopia. Because, you know, here's the thing. Thomas More wrote the book Utopia. And a lot of people think that the word utopia in Latin actually means a perfect place. They don't realize More was smarter than they thought. Utopia actually means no place. Because he knew that this was just a thought experiment. Which is what Marx didn't know. He looked at this and said, hey... You know what? I don't have a theory. I don't have a preference. What I've got is hard science. And this is not only factual, this is inevitable. This is going to work. Don't worry about it. But more new that utopia isn't any place. We can imagine it. We can try and fix up the current system. But to just dive into creating utopia, you're just going to destroy what you've already got. Well, first of all, in the 1800s, in the 19th century, there were hundreds of utopian communities, utopian movements, where the people that were involved in them promised that this was the utopia that was going to work. Go study your American history. You'll find out that all of these utopian movements, except for maybe the Quakers and the Amish, all of them eventually failed. And these were not anarchists. These were not crazies. These were good Christian folk who genuinely believed that Jesus had called them to this, that this was the new world that they were asked to create. You still have the Jehovah's Witnesses. You've got Christian scientists. There are remainders of this movement, but for the most part, the Shakers, all of these utopian movements died because it wasn't sustainable. What is sustainable is what I talked about a few minutes ago. Go down to the local seed store, buy some seeds, build a victory garden in your backyard, Grow some plants. Will it feed the community? No. But this is the difference between 19th century thinking and new millennium thinking. It is victory by the ant farm, victory by thousands of small projects building up into a big thing, rather than one large empire for 350 million people, which is going to lord over all of us and provide the happiness that some people imagine Well, it seems like the 19th and 20th centuries were the eras of these grandiose ideas. We're going to make everything big. We're going to make this huge national government. We're going to have communism where the government's literally so big that it runs every single business and controls every single aspect of life. We're going to have the UN. We're going to have one world government. We're going to have the European Union. It's going to be big, 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 big. And that's the only way we can possibly have enough power to make things work right. And it's breaking. And the revolution started somewhere in the 80s with the the introduction of the IBM PC. And it's happening still. And it is a destruction of these large imperial structures in favor of federated smaller structures that are more manageable. Well, think of this. Now, 
The number of university administrators per student has doubled since 1979. On the other hand, what's happened since 1979, the whole computer revolution, which would make you think that in fact a lot fewer administrators would be needed because that job has gotten much more efficient since computers have come in. So if you figure that we really need fewer administrators, but yet we have more of them, you could say that maybe 75% of the ones that we have are completely unnecessary. So would you say our universities are twice as good as they were in 1979? They're twice as liberal, and if you're a liberal, that's a good thing. Ah, so we've gotten to the real cause behind all of this. Well, the Puritanism of the left is what's got the universities in a bind. Because in, in claiming tolerance, if you pay attention to them, they're only tolerant of people who are willing to toe the line, wear the uniform, and talk the talk. Right, of course, you know... Kim Jong-un is completely tolerant of people who want to talk about how great Kim Jong-un is. Well, but he is great, right? He's the dear leader. Wonderful. That's the thing about free speech. If you don't believe in free speech for people you hate, whose every word grates on your last nerve, then you don't believe in free speech at all. Because the thing is... In Nazi Germany, you were always completely free to say how great the Nazi party and Adolf Hitler were. You just weren't free to say something opposite of that. That's a problem? <clears throat> ah, well, to the right people, I suppose not. So you would call for a return of localism? I would, in self-defense, because I think that it's already collapsing. Like you said, the revolution's already started. It is. So where does it end? If we survive as an intact empire, I'm surprised. I've been of the opinion that it's basically going to be one of two things. It's going to be breakup or it's going to be Caesar. Well, it'll be Caesar before it's breakup. So you ready to go out there and raise the stars and bars, put on the gray uniform? No, I'm ready to go to jail. So you think that's where we're headed, huh? I think my blog and everybody else who's an opposition voice is in trouble, and we are very much in danger of being arrested. Well, that's what Pax Dickinson said once when someone asked him, where do you see the alt-right in 10 years? And he said, a pile of skulls in the corner of a FEMA camp. Pretty much. But I'll happily be one of those skulls. Which I don't think that the 13 protesters on the highway would be. No, because they're part of the optics, part of the signaling that is fashionable, that is the, uh, the new status quo. They want to pretend that they're edgy and out there and opposing the system, but they're totally not. No, they are the new system. Which means they get all the benefits of pretending to be rebels, but also all the benefits of being on the side of the establishment. Yes, sir. Sounds like a pretty sweet gig to me. Thank you, no. You choose something else. I choose to do as my family has done for several centuries, and to be a fly in the ointment, an annoyance to the establishment, and a general pain in the ass. And maybe that's what happened. We've reached a point where when Wells and Catherine were young, the establishment was rightist. When your dad was young, it was in a transition. And now you're at a point where the establishment is solidly way far left. So if you want to continue to be anti-establishment, at this point, you've actually got to be a rightist. Yep. Isn't that a sad state of affairs? My grandma's turning in her grave. All right, so sum up by giving us your solution to the world's problems in a neat little package. It's the same solution that's been for 2,000 years. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies. Take care of your family. Take care of your house. If you have a little land, grow a garden and take care of yourself. That's the idea of concentric circles, that your circles of obligation go outward through first family, then community, then state, then nation, then world. Exactly. And at the center of it is God that's everything. The center of it is Jesus. Well, that sounds like a good place to leave things off unless you've got something else you want to say. Go um, knock on your neighbor's door. I don't know if I'd want to knock on the neighbor's doors around here. <laughs> Fair enough. But other than that, it's probably a good idea. All right, well, that does it for my interview with Psycho Dish this evening. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Pleasure being on the show. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. I will continue this podcast series as I make my way across the country, and I will see you all a little on down the road.
okay, now I'm I'm reflecting my history with Berkeley. If you're not an African American woman who's a lesbian and and has a string of, of broken relationships with other lesbians and don't live in Berkeley and if you're not a frequent uh, drinker at Mama Bear's, then you're not really a citizen of Berkeley. I always preferred Triple Rock. You heathen. Beckett's? But you're a guy. Henry's. You're still a guy. You know, these liberals are awfully hard to please. Yes, they are.